You know, that, oh, the yellow doesn't look good. All right. In progress. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Peter McCarthy. I've um, got a great bunch of people here um, live today, and um, we're here talking about a particular pest. Now, the purpose of our uh, pest uh, profile series, when we're just literally talking about a particular pest, today we're going to talk about the Indian miner, also known as the common miner. But just over the next couple of weeks, we'll talk about various pests. And what I really love when I'm talking to my fellow pesties, you know, I've got Ray, Colin, and a number of other here uh, in, in uh, watching from afar, be it from you know, Sydney, Brisbane, and Gold Coast, and um, ACT, it looks like. But wherever you are, you know, what I'm really excited about when I talk to my fellow pesties, my colleagues in our industry, you know, when we're talking about termites or bed bugs or cockroaches or whatever, I'm really impressed by the ability that everyone has about the technical aspects of these um, insects in a lot of cases and the behavioral aspects of them, the impacts and so on. But often when we're talking about birds, we're sometimes found wanting in that really the, the science of behavioral base. And so today it's just a deep dive into a particular pest. And so today it's the Indian miner. Um, so I am going to share a screen with you and then I'm literally going to just disappear and then we'll, we'll crack on with this. So share that screen. There we go. And I will put that up there. All right. Okay. I think that's worked. All right. I'll just get everybody back over here in the world of Zoom. There we go. Great. All right. Oh, more people coming in. All right. So kicking things off. So today talking about the common, all right, sorry, I'm just letting different people in and I was just getting distracted. So Indian miner. So a really interesting bird that we've got when we're talking about the Indian miners. The interesting thing is we're talking about one of Australia's most despised birds. It's the bird that we all love to hate. So whether you're a professional, like my team of people that are watching from afar, as professional pest managers or homeowners, it's just one of those bird species that's very much despised. I'm not sharing screen. Let's try again. Ah, okay. So now that's working. All right. We're now sharing the screen. So this pest species, the, the common miner or the Indian miner, is Australia's most despised bird. And so from a professional's perspective, we we love to hate this bird because, of course, it's just so difficult to interact with. It's a very intelligent bird species. And I'm going to sort of touch on some of those behavioral aspects when we look at this particular bird. So from, there we go, um, from our discussion points, our discussion points are going to be the same regardless of what species we're talking about. So with our, our, our bird species, we're going to look at uh, the names and the various names, identification, similar species, it's pest status, and uh, it wouldn't be the same of having a webinar without Damien turning up late. So hi, Damien, just joining us now. And um, all right, welcome, Damien. I was just saying to everyone, it wouldn't be the same without Damien turning up just two minutes late, but um, great to have you all here. So just looking at our discussion points, uh, we'll also then look at the legal restrictions, not that there is any other than animal welfare when we're talking about this species, it's distribution throughout Australia, behavior, nesting, food, uh, in, and its impact as a pest species. And towards the end of the discussion, we're going to talk about management option, options. Now, I should say, and I've got a great bunch of, you know, like-minded pesties with me, when I'm talking about Indian miners, I don't have the silver bullet. You're not going to get to the end of this discussion and say, wow, we've got the most amazing control process. When we're looking at India miners more than any other bird species that we're dealing with, we're talking about the IPM strategy or that was developed in the 70s. So integrated pest management, you all know that process. We're going to talk about, you know, cultural aspects. We're going to talk about uh, habitat modification or building modification. We're going to talk about removing food and water and all those processes. So there's going to be nothing mind blowing. I'm just going to make the whole behavioral side of things and as the technical side of things, the way that you'd like to hear something if we were talking about termites or bed bugs or whatever. So looking at the, the names that we, we share on this bird, it's 
actually the common miner, but we tend to refer to it as the Indian miner here in Australia. Its scientific name is Acrodotherus tristus. Um, now it's interesting, I mean, other names, you know, miner spelled incorrectly or cane toad with wings or lots of different names. But the interesting thing about the scientific name, we often like to know how do they come up with that scientific name? And we often say, well, what's the Latin name? Well, in this, in this case, it's the genus name is a Greek uh, name, Acrodotherus, or um, I'm not going to bother with the, the pr correct pronunciation, but Acrodos, which is uh, locust, and then Therus, meaning hunter. So we know that this bird is the locust hunter, or often referred to as the grasshopper hunter, which therein lies the, the reason why it was introduced into Australia back in the 1800s. The Tristus, meaning sad or gloomy, because if you actually have a close look at an India minor, it has a downturned mouth, and so it always has a sad and gloomy look. So a sad and gloomy uh, locust hunter. Um, it's a member of the starling fam family. So like the other bird that we love to hate, other difficult bird that's truly difficult to control, mainly because of its intelligence is the European starling. Both those birds share the same family grouping. The interesting thing is they're all, they're, they're members of the passerine group. So just getting into some really technical things, passerines are the biggest um, family of birds um, that we in, encounter worldwide, but also one of the biggest grouping of pest birds. So a passerine, to be a passerine, there are three elements that make up a passerine. So a passerine is essentially defined by its shape. So the name passer, it's a passer shape. And if we think about a passerine, or sorry, a passer, we think of passer domesticus, and we're thinking about the uh, European sparrow. So the European sparrow is a shape uh, that defines many, many birds, so hence the passerine group. It's also its song, so the vocal aspect of this particular bird groups it in the passerine, and the second and the third thing is its toe configuration. So a passerine has three toes pointing forward and one toe pointing backwards. So hence the Indian miner is a passerine. Other birds that we know that are quite intelligent, members of the passerine group are your corvids and, and magpies, and magpies, particularly intelligent birds, like the Indian miner, uh, the birds, of course, would also be um, uh, the, obviously the, the sparrows and miners, starlings and pigeons and so on. Um, so that's just an interesting aspect to share. So when we're looking at the identification of the bird, well, we're looking at a bird that sits 12 centimetres tall, 23 centimetres long. But when it comes to Indian miners, we're just looking at a very distinctive looking bird. So, you know, white primary feathers in flight. So you'll see sort of the brown, black and the white underneath. But the, the coloration and of the plumage, coloration of the beak, the eye patch and the legs tend to be very, very specific to that bird. This bird's also monomorphic. So birds are generally either polymorphic or monomorphic. Monomorphic meaning the male and the female essentially look the same. Polymorphic means that the male and the female look different. That could be in different terms of size or color plumage. So when we're looking at... Um, um, when we're looking at um, uh, cockatoos and parrots, you often find them being uh, a lot showier in the males or males being a different size, being larger. And so they're polymorphic. Indian miners also very intelligent. The distinctive call, which also lends to its um, inclusion in the passerine group and appearance, just almost unmistakable. Um, opportunistic feeder prefers to uh, nest in artificial locations. So when we're looking at our built environment, this is a bird that's really changed its feeding habits and its nesting habits to live in amongst humans. And um, we'll look at its sort of breeding processes as we go along. But nesting tends to be in spring right through to autumn, so a long nesting period, long-lived long -lived birds, and also highly fecund. So fecund or fecundity is a term that we use about uh, about the success or the survival success of a bird species or any pest species. So generally a pest means it's a bird that has become successful for whatever reason and generally because of its um, interaction with human built environments. So a highly fecund species means the bird's going to live a long life. It uh, has a successful uh, clutching and uh, fledging percentage of young, so a, uh, and also a young 
maternal age or a young breeding age. And so a bird that can actually be highly fecund is successful, lives a long life, can breed from an early age, has large clucks, clutch sizes and has successful breedings and so on. And of course, able to modify its food source to its surrounding. So a successful pest bird or pest insect is generally highly fecund. There you go, another technical term to chuck in. So similar species. Well, there are two similar species that I've worked with when it comes to Indian miners. One, not in Australia. Um, I'm doing a lot of work in the, the day uh, in the um, uh, South Pacific. And so often I was working with both the jungle miner, quite a spectacular look, look, looking um, miner, um, similar slides, slightly bigger, has the crest just above the, the, um, the beak, but a slightly different plumage. Uh, and noisy miner. Well, the noisy miner we work, we don't tend to work with as much, but of course, no, noisy miners around Australia are growing in its population. Again, a bird that's just uh, growing in its populations, um, not so much for um, changes to our building structures, but because of changes to our garden structures. So the noisy miner, note, note the spelling, M-I-N-E-R. It's not a miner, it's a miner and it's a native to Australia, it's a honey eater. So your miners, M-Y-N-A, are protein feeders and looking for a different food group. Honey eaters will be looking at what's in your backyard and in the natural environment for nectar and pollen. Well, the interesting thing about the noisy miners have become you know, quite popular, uh, or sorry, grown in population purely because of the garden selections and the landscaping and Australia's population growth. So as the bird that has different behavioural patterns to the uh, Indian miner, uh, but is also becoming more of a pest, but also being a native, it's a protected species. Maybe we'll talk about that another time. But look, it's a different looking bird, similar if you're just looking at the bird in a distance, eye patches and so on. But essentially, one is a member of the starling family, which is their Indian miner, and then the other one is a honey eater, two different food sources, um, different uh, behavioural patterns and so on. All right, from a pest status, well, Indian miners, apart from being our most despised species of birds here in Australia, um, it is a significant pest. It is um, a major pest from the top to toe of Australia on our east coast. Um, it's interesting that this bird species is also moving inland and is also now found in South Australia and sometimes occasionally into Western Australia and Tasmania. But the interesting thing is, this is a bird species whose population range tends to only increase at about a kilometer a year. So if you look at the, exter the extremities of this bird's range, it's only moving relatively slowly, but building in numbers and then moving forward. And again, it's a bird that actually lives in family groupings. And then as they sort of tend to grow, that grouping tends to um, move um, just by purely growing in size and looking for, for new range. It's an exotic pest bird, so it's actually given no protection status here in Australia. Uh, it was introduced into Australia, and we'll touch on that in a second. Its impact is really on um, a lot of our agricultural cropping and horticultural cropping. And overall, it's uh, just a nuisance in the domestic environment, but also in the hospitality environment. The interesting thing is the IUCN, so the Global Invasive Pest Program, uh, rated this pest and its other family member, the uh, European starling in the world's most 100 most invasive species. And so again, it's not just a problem here, it's actually, you'll see uh, a problem in, in a number of parts of, of the world. From a public perspective, uh, sorry, from a public perception perspective, this bird is our, our most despised bird. Uh, back in 2005, ABC surveyed, um, a, a large proportion of the population, and it was seen to be its most significant pest, uh, the most commonly seen in backyards, the one needing the most um, form of control, and the one bird that the community had its greatest concern, primarily because of the way it's territorial against native species in people's backyard. So unfortunately, the PR exercise that the Indian miner is on needs some help. So um, it's not protected in Australia. So a uh, us as professional pest managers, you know, we can interact with this bird um, uh, as long as we obviously afford the bird all its appropriate animal welfare considerations. Um, population control is um, available to us. I'm not 
going to talk so much about poisoning this particular bird because it, as some of you will know, there's a, obviously a difficult bird to poison. Uh, this is where the intelligence of that bird really takes over. It can be difficult naturally to poison because the um, elders of a family grouping or the older birds, they'll actually stand guard over a poison if they see some of the younger birds or any of the birds uh, fall ill. Um, and so what's been interesting whenever I've um, gone out and, and um, been with pest managers, you know, controlling avicides and so on, it's interesting to see the birds actually stand guard around it to stop other birds from actually interacting with the feed. So difficult bird, one of those birds where it's all about the pre-feeding process and won't be a major part of today's discussion. Trapping, of course, will, and so will other systems and so on. So from a legal restrictions perspective, each state of Australia has different um, areas in which to go for if you're looking to uh, do population control, not so much trapping, but poisoning, and there'll be different restrictions in place. From a distribution perspective, so this is an Asian uh, species, hence the name Indian minor, um, right throughout India, right down to uh, Thailand, up to Pakistan and so on. But it has actually been moved around the world to places like Florida, parts of the UAE and Africa, Maldives, Mauritius, uh, Canary Islands, Australia, of course, New Zealand and the South Pacific. Uh, what is interesting, if you ever needing to get an updated range, um, there's a uh, an invasive animal group, CRC, that um, has collaborated with a whole raft of different agencies to create minor scan. So minor scan, you can Google minor scan and see obviously the impacts, the, the number of trapping or mapping sites where people have, have um, uh, done trapping or created sightings and so on. So a useful resource. All right, so my basic uh, behavioral perspective. So this is a communal roosting species. So the way to find this particular bird is to actually find communal roosts. And so that communal roost will can often be, you know, if you're into commercial or domestic pest management, it's often we are found to be called into an area that's impacted by the noise and the smell and the mess associated with hundreds of Indian miners in a communal roost. And so in that communal roost, you'll find the males on the non-nesting females and the juveniles, uh, whereas the females will be off in another area, depending on uh, the, the location of the tree and also the time of the year, the, the females will be uh, tending to uh, the nest and the young. So often these birds will forage within about a kilometre of that communal roost, and then they'll go back uh, to tend to nest or to, to sleep. And so that communal roost is a, basically a, a roost or a communication location, but a place where a, a large number of activities uh, great number of activity really takes place. So this is a bird that's very uh, territorial and also aggressive. And so other bird species are tended to be, you know, pushed out of that territory of a, of a backyard. So when I grew up um, in Sydney, you know, that backyard had a, a great variety of different bird species from pardalotes and other finches to, to small to large birds of the, the cockatoos. And so the interesting thing is once Indian miners come in, it really become a monoculture of one bird species. So from a nesting perspective, they are a hollow nesting species. So they're always going to be nesting in a natural environment into hollows, hence they'll be pushing native uh, Australian birds, parrots, um, sugar gliders out of those nests and competing for hollows. But in a built environment, they'll just be over the gutters, into the, the roofs and confined spaces, and you'll find little beautiful blue eggs in these really hard to get to confined spaces. Uh, so again, another one of these birds that's really linked its behavior to its environment and of course our built environment. So from a range perspective, the Indian miners will live in a family grouping. And so it's difficult to tell. I always uh, find it interesting when someone rings us and says, oh, I just want to trap Indian miners in a backyard. And I said, well, okay, well, how many birds have you got? So I've only got six. And I say, well, how do you know it's the same six? Because of course they're all relatively identical and they are being a communal roosting bird. The birds will move from these different locations. The same pairs might nest in the same locations, but you'll have different members of this family grouping and the roost coming to different parts of the range. And so that same particular guy said, well, after rang me after a year, he said, you know, you are right. He said, I didn't have six birds. I've actually trapped 96 birds in the same, in the backyard. 
And so it's interesting, they are moving around, except of course, when they're nesting. So they'll sleep their night in a communal roost, forage in that one kilometer area, but that communal roost is really worth while uh, locating, particularly if it's in the range of your client, because of course that is the location or the most ideal location for trapping. So finding them, well, the communal roost, streetscapes, uh, domestic and commercial roof areas. And of course, we only have to look at the, for the birds themselves, the noise and the mist and the droppings associated with uh, a communal roost. So what's interesting about the history of some of the birds, particularly when we're, we're talking about native species, of course, some of the native birds have just started to increase their range or change their feeding habits or all because of our built environment. Well, the Indian mine is an interesting one because it was introduced to Australia. So back to the name Acrodotherus tristis, um, you know, the gloomy uh, locust uh, hunter or grasshopper hunter. And um, it's interesting, they were introduced into Melbourne and Sydney um, back in the 1800s, 1862 here in Melbourne, uh, to control uh, bugs in the market gardens of Melbourne. And so the interesting thing is back in those days, they didn't have insecticides. If you wanted to remove insects from the vegetables that were feeding those colonies back in the day, you had to physically remove the bugs. And so the thought was, let's bring in different birds and what better bird to bring in would be the locust hunter. Um, but of course they were very unsuccessful. But even that was uh, the case 20 years later, they were uh, released in Townsville and Innisfail uh, in North Queensland uh, to see if they would actually impact the cane beetle um, impacting sugarcane. Of course, that was also unsuccessful. Now, back in 1968 and 71, 110 birds were released on a couple of different occasions in Canberra. I'm actually not entirely sure why they were released, but just over that last how old am I? It's, uh, 53, 54 years. There's the quick maths. Um, that bird has now become one of the most common birds in, um, uh, in Canberra. And back uh, at Canberra, of course, we have one of the, the better community groups in the control of Indian miners, which is a, the Canberra Indian Miner Action Group. And they've done a tremendous work, and we'll touch on that in a sec. But the bird's range is also just increased by heading into Tasmania, heading over to Western Australia and South Australia. And of course, for the same purposes, the bird was also released in New Zealand. Now over in New Zealand, it hasn't quite reached the pest status, even though it's quite prevalent when I've been over there, both on North and South Island, New Zealand doesn't quite have the, the native fauna and the native birds and, and small mammals in trees uh, that we do here in Australia. So we, we tend to have developed a hatred for Indian miners just because of the way they've removed our native fauna from um, the range of our backyards. So um, haven't quite seen that in New Zealand quite to that extent. From a nesting perspective, well, they'll be nesting uh, spring, summer and autumn, but spring and autumn particularly, and you'll see little gorgeous, uh, little blue eggs um, in the, the, the roof spaces of your uh, clients or in confined spaces. So four to six eggs, so a decent clutch size for, for this bird, short incubation period and um, a medium size 22 to 24 day fledging period. And so again, we, we just see just a, a great survivorship in the young and uh, a relatively fast to medium um, sized uh, breeding pattern there with incubation and fledging. Uh, but typically where you'll find these nests is in, in roofs, um, perhaps in hollow logs in, in yards, but just in confined spaces where they're accessing. Um, so from a food perspective, this is a bird that literally mixes its artificial and its natural food sources with ease. Um, very opportunistic food feeder. So in the natural environment, so in backyards, they're looking for insect spiders, small reptiles, small mammals, even birds, uh, eggs, seeds, and so on. But in the built environment, they'll be into our um, our waste management areas, transfer stations. So the transfer station I worked in just the other day had about 600 Indian miners and they would all be heading off to a communal roost in that community area. And so they have a, an easy access to food in our built environment. So impacts on Australia, well, impact wise, we see them having a huge impact on the horticultural and the agricultural pursuits of Australia. So grain crops, fruit crops, um, every, anything from strawberry ground crops right through to cre uh, tree crops 
Uh, where I am here in Melbourne, of course, we've got the viticultural and apple growing very close to, uh, to Melbourne. And so it's a, a major issue right throughout this area, but all up and down the East Coast. Hence right, the, the reason why in say Tasmania and Western Australia, uh, very strong growing areas of Australia, always trying to keep um, the likes of the, the miners out if they possibly can. From a public uh, amenity point of view, of course, it's annoy annoying bird smell, noise, um, and constantly um, having an impact on the native species in and around the territories of our backyards. From a commercial aspect, well, I'll focus their attention on the hospitality areas, both with alfresco dining areas, cafes, and so on, and have an impact both on food safety, increased maintenance and cleaning, and also just the negativity associated with trying to keep birds from the table that you're eating your uh, plate of food at. So quite a strong, uh, impact on, on us as members of the community. They certainly compete strongly with native species, both um, small mammals like sugar gliders and our bird species and parrots. So that's a real issue, particularly in some areas where you've got Indian miners and um, European starlings in the range of our swift parrots and other endangered species like the uh, orange-bellied parrots and so on. But aggressive little bugger. So here's on my left of the screen as I wanted posted, that was actually uh, when I lived up north, that's from uh, Lismore Shire Council. So they were just saying wanted, you know, remove birds, be it um, with uh, trapping and so on. And the reasons why attacking small chicks, evicting small native birds and so on, and mammals from their nests and so on. Uh, but also fouling the backs of livestock and, and contaminating bins and so on. So that's uh, mm -hmm. a, a, an interesting way to, to say. Other councils have actually had bounties and really encouraged um, members of the, the, the public and ratepayers in their local area by supplying uh, free traps and so on. So from a management perspective, really interesting because I, I don't have the silver bullet when it comes to this particular bird species. It's a variety of different things that we're going to look at. Now, excluding this bird wherever possible is going to be one of the ways we are going to be successful because of course, netting when we're working in say warehouses or shelters and loading docks will be one of our primary uh, ways of control, uh, well, managing um, Indian miners. And I'll show you some photos in a moment. Bird shark will be one of those great products that we're going to use for edge protection. And when we're using something like bird shock, sometimes it'll have wider range of deterrence. So if a bird just gets shocked a number of times on a building, it will tend to try and stay clear of that particular area. Bird spikes, a little less effective because of course, most of the bird spikes are designed for pigeons and larger, but we'll touch on that. Amplified or acoustic or ultrasonic systems and even visual deterrent systems that we work with will probably be of little use. So. It won't be a, a key part of our focus. And a lot of the manufacturers of different systems around the world will almost keep Indian miners out of their recommendations. So we'll probably have to look at population management, way of actually reducing the population, reducing the pressure that those birds place on the systems. And of course, trapping will be a possibility. I'll really dive into talking about some of the trapping programs I've been involved in. Population control through poison will probably be less of a focus. All right. So just looking at from an exclusion perspective, well, us all here as professionals, we're going to look at uh, a netting system. And so looking at exclusion, well, obviously here's an example of a loading dock between two buildings. So we'll call that a breezeway, but there we'll just look at netting. And so obviously you're going to frame the, the net sizes with your uh, cable and, and, and um, and fittings and look at excluding the birds from entirely accessing that area. Now, we do also know that Indian miners will still come and forage if there's food and rubbish as there is down at the right hand side of this particular photo. But all we can do in this case is actually stop the birds from sitting above the subject, which in this case would be the product being uh, loaded onto um, trucks and then going off to supermarkets and so on. So again, a management process rather than a control process. Here's another example of a warehouse. It's one of Josh's photos that um, this looks like something up north. And so there we had um, a, ra a range of different birds. So again, netting size is really important. So we're starting with 19 millimeter um, net with a 10 year warranty. And here's an example, probably difficult to see on the screen, but I can actually see some really intricate netting going on in this particular 
uh, photograph. So it's about a 2,800 square metre uh, warehouse. And so just all the cabling and netting, just moving across with the beams. Um, but we can share those photos. Here's another classic example where Indian miners are going to be a problem. So here in, in Melbourne, so you've got uh, classic loading docks over either your typical loading bays and then over um, areas of high speed doors and the netting will actually stop birds from actually sitting above the loading area. And there's going to be, particularly with high speed doors, less likelihood, but still a likelihood, but less likelihood of birds uh, penetrating into the warehouse and um, by having netting in that situation. And of course, well, I don't know whether you can see this, but this is just a schmozzle of the magnificence of, a, of an aircraft hangar. And so when you're trying to actually net over this sort of amount of uh, substructure in the roof and st uh, structure and beams around the, the walls, essentially what we're doing there is just trying to remove all the different entry points up into that roof structure and stop birds from sitting above the subject below. And of course the impact on, on um, plane fuselages and even just the slippery floors of epoxy floors and bird droppings can be uh, a fairly significant issue. And here's an example of a drying room. Actually, this is a job that Josh went over to New Zealand for, but again, uh, starlings and Indian miners up in that roof, popping down onto uh, the food groups that are dried in these particular areas and stored. And so again, not necessarily stopping the birds from actually coming into an area, but limiting the areas in which that they can uh, see. So I guess, I don't know if you can see my cursor there, but again, we've got the net line running along here, up with the A-frame, all right, down and over to the right there. So a really neat, a neat job. So, from it, I guess, look, just looking at exclusion, that'll be the purpose of trying to um, keep doors closed, stopping birds entering, removing food sources wherever possible. In these cases, all we're doing is stopping the bird from sitting above the subject. Um, looking at bird shock, classic example of where we're looking at or using edge protection. And so bird shock, and most of you who are actually in our group, or at least I've had um, uh, time to discuss with over the years have used bird shock. Bird Shop's one of those amazing products that we brought into the, we started bringing into the country back in 2006. And so this is a great product for uh, discrete edge protection with that next level of secret source, the deterrence of electricity. And so great outcome. And it's probably going to be a significantly better outcome if we were using physical devices. So not ideal if you've got large numbers of birds nesting because they'll still be quite committed to the site, but nine times out of 10 bird shock will be very useful on parapets, ledges, and architectural features that are just long and narrow. And certainly from a Indian miner perspective, they're smart enough to know better to stay, stay off. So here's an example of uh, this particular situation just happened to be seagulls, but again, you're getting the example of trying to um, look at the, the front and the rear of a parapet in which to remove the birds. And every time they get shocked, they'll, that'll be quite a memorable situation for them. Another example of bird shock just on the outer edge of a parapet around a building. And uh, there are other forms of shock systems. And so uh, tree shock would be quite useful and examples would be, say, in places like, say, Dubbo for the council and a number of other of our, our pest management clients have installed tree shock. So tree shock can be either battery powered or solar powered. It's really useful because naturally you've got a tree, which is the communal roost often, often for Indian miners and European starlings. And so this is a great way that you can actually have a relatively discreet product that can then branch off literally and follow each of the branches or as many of the branches. It's just, a, you know, um, in this particular case, you're probably not covering the entire tree, just like in a lot of cases, you're not trying to cover an entire building, but you're doing a bit of a representative that every once in a while that the birds land in this particular tree, they get shocked and they'll tend to stay off. And so essentially this is a braided, um, uh, what would you call it? A braided line that just is cable tied or um, almost nailed with an aluminium nail, aluminium being the most important aspect when you're nailing into a tree, uh, but it can be a very useful product to actually provide that 
electric jolt that we're looking for. So here's a close up photo of um, how the product can actually move uh, over a branch and you can actually then also then have it to wire off up to other branches and so on. And so really useful product, particularly in council situations and examples where you've got a communal roost in a public space. Now birds bikes, I'm not going to sort of say that this is a, a great option to use when it comes to Indian miners and starlings and your smaller species. Um, there are a bunch of different spikes out and some spikes have prongs that are much closer together than others. But look, in all honesty, um, it's a risk. And so the idea is if I've got a really full sun area, I would call that a light pressure situation. So the birds are actually just landing on a parapet. Um, they don't really need to be there. There's plenty of other places that they might be nesting and roosting and so on, then that might be a possibility. But if I've got a, an area where I've got some sort of coverage and where I've got area, areas like louvers and places that Indian miners are going to coming in to roost and nest and even just to communally gather, then I wouldn't be using bird spikes. Um, and here's an example up top. Well, the examples of um, uh, seagulls can actually land on spikes and then obviously coverage is just so important but also a location is really important and then the bird species. And so I can, on most of these occasions, we're also suggesting that this is a system that's really not designed for Indian miners. Something that we just brought in and I was just speaking to a client just earlier today. So I put this in and he said, oh, I'm really keen when I can actually use our possum spikes on say a fence, fence line or a colorblind fence when you're actually covering the entire area with, um, a plastic spike and so that's more likely to be able to get you some sort of control with some of your smaller species of birds is when you would normally be using it to stop possums using it as a uh, as a walkway and so that's an interesting thought um, and so something that we'll have a look at to see if you can use these for indian miners as well so exclusion netting well i must admit i've um uh this is an example of um for seagulls, but we've had plenty of examples of air conditioning plant rooms just full of Indian miners and even the Indian miners using it as both a nest and a communal roost and having literally hundreds of Indian miners in places like this. So this is an example where uh, netting is put in. And so example where essentially you're trying to exclude the birds from that particular area for nesting. And so obviously nesting and birds and obviously bird droppings interacting with the air intake of a facility of course is a major issue for those working inside an office area or even a domestic situation now of course one of the main entry points that birds have into a roof of course is through the gutter and so while we have gutter spikes and a number of other different configurations one of the best ways to keep indian miners out of uh gutters and therefore stop them from accessing up into the tiled or into the color bond roof or corrugated roof is using either uh, a gutter brush or in fact just using uh, a gutter mesh and so we have lots of different there's lots of different plastic meshes around um, for use for that purpose but also plastic and metal meshes but from a professional's perspective using a gutter brush is a really simple way uh, so we have an Australian made gutter brush which we really like and so the idea is that you can just utilize that and that will form fit into most Australian gutters. And there's about four different sizes there. So that's a pretty cool option when you've got Indian miners or European starlings coming into a domestic, uh, domestic gutters, but more so domestic roofs. And so there's just a close up, bit of a blurry old close up that one. But also we're going to talk about um, solar panels. So again, just while we were just touching on the gutter brush, there's a couple of different sizes in gutter brush that you can just use under um, under solar panels, domestic solar arrays that will just actually lock into place. And so here's an example where they're using 150 or even um, 175 millimeter brush that just locks into place. And so you can also cable tie the both together so it all stays in place. Uh, but the other way of uh, considering um, an area that we have traditionally thought about for pigeons and for seagulls, well, Indian miners are also using the uh, solar panels as a place to create nests and so occasionally rather than just seeing the other bird species you'll often find little blue eggs in smaller nests 
and that'll be your Indian miners. And so again, using a, an exclusion mesh on your uh, domestic or commercial solar arrays will be a useful way to keep Indian miners from nesting underneath. All right, so just another close up of um, a system that's um, readily available. Now, Eagle Eye, I uh, was going to have a big red cross over here because the first thing that the folks at Eagle Eye in South Africa will say is don't use Eagle Eye for Indian miners. And I must admit, I would probably say the same thing. So I was going to have a little red cross. Oh, I've forgotten, I meant to have a red cross. So it's interesting, it's always important to, that um, when we've got Indian miners as perhaps as a minor pest, so to speak, and then you've got obviously larger birds where you might use eagle eye, that would be quite useful. And obviously when we spoke last week, when we we're talking about seagulls, well, that was really important because of course, not only is eagle eye very useful for seagulls, you really need to look at creating a, a whole of building approach. And that would be for seagulls and pigeons and probably not for Indian miners. I'm gonna to touch on Indian miners. Oops, sorry, I just let someone else in. Indian miners, um, when it comes to trapping is probably going to be a difficult process when it comes to professionals. And I'll explain the reason why. But back in the late um, 1990s, um, one of the main universities studying Indian miners came up with a trapping process. And so their trapping process created the two chamber trap. That two chamber trap later became the minor magnet, which is actually pictured on your right there. It was a six foot tall trap by three foot by three foot. And it was developed by the Australian National University. And so that was an interesting development because up until that time, Indian miners could never be trapped and all, and same with European starlings. And so the idea is, was to create a, a happy environment, both for them to enter into feed, but also then go up to what was considered a communal roost. So from an Indian miner control per perspective, in the 2000s, as the birds really started to grow in number, particularly in, in uh, the East Coast and in, in Canberra, community groups, councils and homeowners started to work together. And a lot of them were led by the uh, CIMAG, which is the Canberra Indian Miner Action Group, which are really one of those leading groups that advised, created protocols, created procedures for trapping. And so all along the East Coast, a lot of um, councils got very involved in the trapping of Indian miners or supplying traps to ratepayers. Around about that same time, that miner magnet you see on the right was commercialized and, um, and it then developed the Indian miner, um, sorry, the mini miner magnet and then became part of, of Pest IT. But interesting thing back in 2012, uh, Bundaberg Council created a, uh, a rate payers bounty. And so uh, for uh, miners that were ethically caught and euthanized and um, bounties were paid by the council. So an interesting way in which to actually try and bring down the population in a certain area. Um, and I, you can just imagine, you know, in, in um, Bundaberg, particularly quite a good uh, crop growing area uh, for fruit and vegetables and of course for, for sugar cane. Um, so in the Australian Capital Territory and Collins in our little discussion group here today, um, CIMAG was just one of those groups that went in and studied this pest, created trapping protocols, um, worked with men's sheds, worked with correctional facilities and um, got involved in trapping. In fact, over a, a period of time, um, they had, uh, back in 2005, they'd uh, trapped 28,000 um, Indian miners. And then later on, I think they got up to around about 44,000 uh, Indian miners that had been trapped over a very long and successful process. And so that's a lot of traps. So about 12,000 traps had been given out to and loaned out and returned um, to uh, Canberrans. So quite an amazing thing. One of the interesting statistics that was in, in place. So the Canberra bird watchers have been taking note of bird species that they had been encountered right back since the, the early 2000s. And so what they would do is note the different bird species, both native and exotic. And then they would actually just tally that up at the end of the year in 2006. Uh, the Indian miner was the third most commonly encountered species in Canberra. Well, if you look at the number of birds that CIMAG and, uh, and Canberra was also the home of minor magnet in the day, but the amount of trapping that took place then rendered over the next 
you know, five or so years, um, went from being the third to the 14th to the 20th most common species. So it meant that the numbers were declining and the populations of other birds were succeeding and perhaps returning to, um, to people's backyards. And so it just goes to show over a big community area that wide scale trapping can have a very positive impact both on the numbers of birds, but also the impacts, the positive impact of native species being able to return. Um, so I haven't got any statistics since that time, but that group has been extremely active since those days. So the Minor Magnet was a company that actually I got involved in uh, years ago as first as a distributor and then I just bought that business. But they, that was uh, five years of development by a group of Australian, at Australian National University. And they designed a two-chamber trap that was very species specific. You actually generally only get European starlings and Indian miners in that particular trap. So it was commercialized in 2004, 2006, and then modified to become the mini minor magnet and then joined the pest IT stable of our products. And so the interesting thing is that with the, the tall or original minor magnet or the smaller mini minor magnet, it actually is a quite a useful way to capture um, Indian miners and also European starlings. The difference there being European starlings do not like being in confined spaces. In fact, they will tend to really bash themselves in a trap. So even though in Australian legislation, birds have to be removed from the traps on a 24 hour basis, um, in other parts of the country, of other parts of the world, um, we've left decoy birds in and actually they've become quite accustomed and quite happy to actually call other birds in. And so Indian miners are actually quite comfortable in, in these traps at times. So the mini miner magnet is just really part of that whole IPM approach. So you're just trying to utilize uh, uh, a trapping process while putting in other forms of um, effective control. And so habitat modification, food reduction, and then your traditional bird management strategies is, tends to be the way forward when it comes to Indian miners. No silver bullet, I'm afraid. So looking from a trapping cycle perspective, what you're looking for is obviously trapping within your clients, you know, um, confines, but if you can, you would be looking for the communal roost. And if you can just be trapping from a communal roost, and so from a trapping perspective, we're going to use um, either a dog food or a cat food, be it a wet or a dry, and we'll look at that in a moment. And we're going to use on a white dinner plate, have the birds feeding. And then we can actually modify the trap to allow birds to come into the trap and then into the trap and leave, and then into the trap and being caught over a, you know, a one to two week period. Now, the tractant wise, a wet dog food is going to be the most attractive to Indian miners because they're really, really um, looking for um, protein in their food, particularly as they're going to the, the nesting period, which of course is commencing um, right about now. So a moist dog food or a dried cat food can be useful. And um, that's a proven way to bring um, the Indian miners and European starlings into these traps. From a trapping perspective, we've been lucky enough to um, do uh, be involved in some wide scale trapping. Um, so over in Denarau Island in Fiji, we worked with a lot of the uh, resorts to deploy large numbers of um, traps. That was a good learning experience for me because it was interesting to, to look at how we can you know, communicate with a large group of people, deploy traps. Um, there's the pluses and minuses of working in a, both a resort and what would essentially be uh, you know, a, a third world small island nation, but the whole idea is large numbers of birds being removed from the environment has a positive impact on the client. It's just um, naturally has a challenge being um, uh, the commercial venture of the resorts. They want to focus on what resorts do. Um, and of course, they also want to look at um, uh, the, the tropical aspect of the climate also does present some challenges both to your food and to the trap. And also right now, it'd be interesting to see what impacts would be on Indian miners in environments where there's obviously COVID and limited tourism as certainly would be the case in Fiji right now. But of course, one of those things is uh, using not only the right attractant, but also putting your traps in the, the right location. So here's uh, a lot of the trapping that we did over in Fiji. We actually trapped not so much on the ground, but on apartments and also on the, the rooftops of the hotels. And unlike the food sources that we use here in Australia, we use chips and whatever the birds were coming into and stealing off the, the patrons or the guests 
tables. And so chips and, and, and all sorts of different foods was a, a great way to actually capture birds. Um, so again, we were quite um, successful, but again, um, birds tend to be under distress when out in full sun. And so we also used um, uh, um, shade cloth, but also palm trees and so on to give the birds some level of shade. And so some of the trapping techniques, we also used to use a decoy bird, which I'll talk about that because it's obviously not something that's legal here in Australia because the birds have to be removed on a daily basis. But as I caught birds, um, I would actually have a marking pen with me and I would actually put a mark on a leg of the bird. And that's when I know that that would be the bird that would stay in there with food and water and shelter. And that would stay there for the duration of the trapping program at that resort. And that bird became very tame. And so as it called more birds in, they would all be removed, but the bird with the black mark on the leg would be the one that would stay in there. Um, so again, not part of Australia's animal welfare considerations, but I just thought I'd share that with you as well. Um, in Australia, we don't tend to get any non-targeted species into your different minor traps. Um, in Fiji, of course, here's an example. I've got a mongoose in that trap. So I got someone to remove that because I didn't want to be um, mucking around um, uh, on there. Oh, look, there's, quick, there's questions there. I better get back to that. Uh, but yeah, mongooses were um, quite an interesting um, species to interact with your, your various different trapping processes. Um, so like anything, you have a, a trapping cycle. And so I'll talk about that from a professional's perspective. So the idea is that this is a trap that can actually be deployed all fully set up. Um, or you could um, go with the trapping cycle where you pre-feed on a, on a white dinner plate so it's obvious that there's food out and then the, that dinner plate could go into the entry cage and then into the trap cage and then you could actually then put on the walk-in valves and the um, fuzzle valves to stop the birds from uh, gaining, uh, sorry, um, exiting the trap. And so the idea is that from any pre-feeding point of view, whether you're using pigeons or, or working with pigeons or Indian miners. Indian miners are so much more intelligent. So obviously we're going to go through a couple of the stages that you need to be aware of. Um, but you might be best having the birds come to a pre-feeding location, then being able to enter and exit the traps whenever they want. And it's only at a later stage which you put the, the various entry and, and exit um, valves on the, on the trap. And that could be done over a one to two week period. One of the difficulties that you have in a professional trapping ar arrangement is that you cannot touch an Indian miner trap during the daylight hours. And so therein lies, you know, thinking about what we all do, work in daylight hours, and that we want to actually remove the birds from uh, an environment. But if those birds see you interacting with their food source and what is essentially the trap, they will stay away from it. And not only will they stay away from it, they recognize that green trap or the wire mesh trap, or also Indian miners have a facial recognition for about 14 days. And so the idea is that they will actually recognize you interacting with that food and they will see anything that you do and they'll stay away from it. So the interesting thing is some of the bird species in the passerine group have really good um, facial recognition. The facial recognition of a uh, magpie is up to about 28 days and so they'll actually see someone that they befriend, befriend in their territory um, or they'll also see someone that they don't like in the territory and it could be a cyclist with a black you know a, a black helmet on and so don't be the other cyclist in the black helmet that comes into that territory because they'll just swoop and so on but they'll befriend people that feed them in that environment and they'll recognize their face. Indian miners the same but they'll actually stay away from any trap that you interact with if you touch it during the day. So hence nighttime operations, whenever we were working in, in island nations, uh, or if you're doing a backyard arrangement and working with a homeowner, it's great for homeowners to do their own treatment when it comes to minor trapping, because they can go out at night. They can remove the birds in the cage because when they do so, they make quite a startling squawking sound and that alerts other birds to it. Well, if they see that happening and you're removing the birds from the cage, they will not go near that green cage for at least a month or two and it's time to pack up the trap and put it away. Same with putting in the feed in on a daily basis. You can't have the birds see you do that. And I remember um, doing that in uh, Fiji early on and a friend of mine, a colleague that was doing a trapping program over in Canary Islands, she actually 
rang me from Canary Islands and said, Peter, you're touching the traps during the day. What are you doing? You know not to do that. And I said, yeah, I know, but it's so much easier to do that. But I, on this particular photo that I had posted, she, I said, no birds were there. I just went out on the balcony and put some food in. And she said, oh, go and have a, um, increase the size of the photograph, have a look to the left and guess what's happening. And across the um, opposing, um, uh, opposing um, balcony, was an Indian miner watching me interact with the, the trap. So just when you think that they're not watching, they're watching. It's during daylights, so you're interacting with their feeding, the trap and the bird removal and so on. And so it has to be done at night, which makes it a difficult process. Otherwise, don't bother trying. That would be my advice. So from a um, dispatching point of view, well, if you look at um, the RSPCA guidelines uh, with dealing with a lot of uh, Exotic pests, when you're euthanizing, they say the best example would be cervical dislocation, so the wringing of the bird's neck as the most humane and also the lowest cost option, but most humane. Um, we've developed, uh, for those that are squeamish and particularly homeowners, um, just a humane way to dispatch the birds, and that's the introduction of CO2 into a bucket. Of course, um, car exhaust is of no use to anyone because car exhaust um, there's no carbon monoxide in car exhaust much these days, except for that first start of the car, but very difficult to get that happening. Um, so hence the, the use of a safe or um, CO2 dispatching kit. So from that dispatching kit, fast, humane kill, and you have to remove the birds from the trap, which of course is probably one of the downside because you actually have to have the birds in a confined space, low cost, portable, lightweight, easy to use. So just looking at it here as a, just an example of some um, uh, volunteers that I used. Um, so I've used um, a bucket with a cross cut in the top and entering the live bird in there. Um, the, obviously lid stays on and then putting the CO2 in from a valve down below. Then all of a sudden you see this white wispy air coming up through the top. And that just tells you that the CO2 is um, uh, right through the, the, uh, the bucket. And of course, you know, 15 seconds, they're all off to sleep, 45 seconds, they're all, they're all dead. Um, point in question on the right, so there. So um, from a uh, perspective of Indian miners, it's interesting that we don't have a silver bullet, but it'd be great to know that, you know, what everyone else is, is doing, but when it comes to this particular bird species, it's just that combination approach, trapping, um, poisoning or shooting as a potential option, but difficult to do when it comes to a, an intelligent species, um, your bird shock, your physical devices, exclusion devices, and so on. Um, does Oz Oxy Fresh system work on them? Okay, um, clever question there, Cole. Um, as you know, Cole, um, I've been involved in a number of installations of the ozone system in New Zealand um, for bird control. Our Australian ones um, uh, haven't been for Indian miners, but certainly in New Zealand, um, we've got a number of instances where we've got um, Indian miners and European starlings. So the answer would be uh, yes. Ozone being used for bird control is basically any, any of the species of obviously birds that breathe, having with air sacs, um, ozone does impact the, um, uh, the respiratory system of birds. So the answer would be yes. Uh, sorry, I have to flick through some photos. Uh, dinner hour trapping on uh, um, dinner hour island, it's only a rort if you're not part of it. So yes, it was possibly a travel rort on my behalf, but it was certainly a good way to actually learn as well. So yeah, okay, so no questions. Uh, no more questions there. So just finishing up, I mean, when we're looking at Indian miners, significant pest, not a protected species, consult your local um, uh, jurisdictions in each state for different poisoning requirements. From a distribution and behavioral perspective, well, they are one of the most difficult birds in which we have to control in our professional processes. We've discussed its impact as a pest species and the various management problem, um, uh, various management options. From a perspective of our various webinars, so I'll pick another pest to actually share some detail with you in the coming weeks and more uh, webinars in the form of um, industry leadership interviews. 
but I'd encourage you all just to, when you've got a moment, to have a quick uh, flick through all the different webinars that are on our on our different pages, particularly on our web uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, be a great way just to give yourself up to date, particularly if you're stuck in lockdown like many of us are. So um, what I want to do is just say um, thanks for everyone for being involved today. I hope I've just been able to add some level of entertainment or some technical aspects uh, for you. And um, yeah, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions offline. If you need any more details from me, please make some contact. And if we can help in any way, well, we will. All right. We'll see you all in the, the coming weeks. I hope uh, you're getting plenty of work done that you can. Those of you who are in lockdown like us, we really um, appreciate your involvement. Um, and if there's ways that we can help, well, let's just see. Stay safe. All right. Take care, guys. See you soon.